Okay, good afternoon again. Uh, so I'd like to, this morning we were discussing um, some permanent structures that might form in protoplanetary disks. So I'd like to follow that uh, this afternoon by discussing transient structures um, in, uh, in disks, okay? And this will be the last of the, uh, the sort of uh, main disk processes lectures. Uh, the last lecture tomorrow will be on disk dispersal and discussing what could bring an end to the, uh, to the, disk, uh, to the disk lifetime. So let's think about uh, transient structures. And obviously that's a, a rather, uh, rather loose term. Um, and so what I mean by it principally is if we have a disk that has turbulence within the disk of whatever form, uh, what kind of large-scale structures might form spontaneously within that turbulence? Okay? Clearly, if we have a turbulent disk, we expect there will be small-scale structures associated with the, the small scales of the turbulence within the disk. Um, but here we might be interested principally in what will happen on larger scales that might produce, for example, the pressure maxima that we were talking about this morning, um, or perhaps vortices um, uh, in the disk that we might uh, be able to observe directly. So we can maybe uh, approach this to, to start with from a point of view of thinking about what we expect in different, uh, in different turbulent systems. Okay? And I would say the sort of general expectations are that if you have three-dimensional turbulence, so you know, in the model case you just have a, a box of fluid that's being stirred on some large scale and is dissipating energy at the viscous scale on some very, very small scale, uh, in three-dimensional turbulence, the normal uh, description of that is a cascade of energy that goes from the large scales down through the inertial range to the small scales and is then dissipated by viscosity on those, um, on those uh, small scales. Okay? So that's sort of the, uh, the normal Kolmogorov picture um, of, of turbulence where you have large eddies and then within the large eddies there are smaller eddies and this continues uh, all the way down to the viscous scale. Now, if you have two-dimensional turbulent systems, uh, it's quite well known, both theoretically and in, uh, and in the laboratory, that those can exhibit quite different behavior. And in particular, two-dimensional turbulent systems can also support a so-called inverse cascade, where structure spontaneously forms on large scales, uh, even if you're sort of stirring the system um, at intermediate um, spatial scales. So, which of these uh, kind of uh, systems would apply, would apply to disks? Well, here it's obviously not quite so, uh, quite so obvious. Uh, protoplanetary disks are clearly three-dimensional systems, in principle. However, they're also uh, quite strongly flattened systems. Okay? So even if you consider the mid-plane conditions, the vertical thickness may be an order of magnitude or more smaller than the, uh, smaller than the radial scale. So in that sense, they're sort of uh, somewhere between two and three-dimensional. If you go further up in the disk, away from the mid-plane, then the density drops off very rapidly. There's a strong vertical stratification. And so as you go away from the midplane, if you like, they become more and more two-dimensional because the density is dropping as this Gaussian function. Uh, and so you know, one pressure scale height defined as, a, as an E-folding of the, uh, the pressure, uh, that physical scale gets smaller as you go high up um, in the disk. So we're somewhere between the two- and three-dimensional uh, regime. Now, if we have two-dimensional systems, uh, then that's the case where we can have this, uh, this inverse cascade and we can get an idea of what can happen in those kind of systems, uh, you know, not from thinking about theoretical considerations, but just by looking at nearby systems that exhibit this kind of sort of two-dimensionality. So here's two examples, um, both are from Jupiter. So Jupiter, if we consider the atmosphere, so Jupiter is obviously a three-dimensional system, but the pressure scale height of the atmosphere is, of course, a very, very small fraction of the radius of the, uh, of the planet. So if you consider the atmosphere uh, at a particular pressure scale height, that's uh, very well described as a two-dimensional system. And in that kind of system, you can have these very long-lived uh, vortices. Here's Jupiter's great red spot, which has been sitting there for hundreds of years. Uh, there's discussion about uh, how it might evolve in the future, but it's clearly a very long-lived system compared to the natural time scales um, of Jupiter. And then something else you can also see on Jupiter, but looking at a larger scale, um, is if you look at the wind speed, here's wind speed in meters per second versus, uh, versus latitude, uh, two plots here from Cassini data and Voyager data uh, way back in 1980. And what you can see here is that the wind speed has this uh, oscillatory uh, pattern 
Uh, you have different wind speeds at, at different, uh, different latitudes. You have bands of winds that are rotating around Jupiter um, at different speeds. Okay? So these are, if you like, zonal flows um, in the atmosphere um, of Jupiter. So the question we will have is, uh, can you have either vortices or zonal flows or some combination of these systems um, also appearing um, in, in protoplanetary disks? Okay? And for the moment, uh, that's primarily been a theoretical question, because we don't have observations of this quality of protoplanetary disks. Um, but as we've been seeing uh, this morning, we might see a little bit more about uh, later, you know, observations of protoplanetary disks are now starting to approach the resolution where you can actually directly perhaps see these structures um, if they are present on the large scale um, in disks. So I'd like to start with, uh, with zonal flows, which are uh, in some sense the more recent suggestion for protoplanetary disks. There's been much older suggestions of uh, vortices dating back, I think, even to the, uh, to the 1940s. Um, but zonal flows are actually a little bit simpler in some sense to, to understand uh, how those might work um, in disks and vortices. So let's start with the zonal flows. And there was work by uh, Anders Johansson, uh, Andrew Yudin, and Hubert Klaw uh, back in 2009 uh, who considered ideal MHD simulations of protoplanetary disk turbulence, very similar to the ones uh, that we were talking about at the, uh, at, the start, uh, at the start of the week. And what they found there was that if you did those calculations in large enough uh, domains, large enough volumes, uh, they found the spontaneous formation of zonal flows um, in, their, in their calculations. And this is the, uh, the argument they made uh, for why those zonal flows um, would form. So what they argued was that the fundamental thing that happens is that you have an inverse cascade that works in the magnetic variables and leads to a large-scale variation in the magnetic field strength, particularly the toroidal magnetic field strength, at different locations um, within the simulated uh, disk. Okay? Now that large-scale magnetic field structures lead to a variation in the magnetic stress within the disk. Okay? Remember, when we think about the magnetic stress, we're thinking about the correlation between BR, the radial component of the magnetic field, and B phi, the azimuthal uh, component. So if you can get a large-scale variation in the magnetic field, say in the troidal component, that will feed through to a large-scale variation um, in the magnetic stress. And that variation in the magnetic stress, they found, led to peaks and troughs um, in the disk surface density um, appearing but in such a way that those peaks and troughs, which obviously would create a pressure gradient in the disk, the forces from that pressure gradient were balanced by variations in the azimuthal velocity um, of the flow uh, in their simulated uh, disks. Okay. So what happened then was that you didn't create, if you like, an instantaneously pressure unbalanced system that of course would produce waves and, and things like that, but rather a system that is in rotational, if you like, rotational hydrostatic equilibrium, um, but where you have peaks of density balanced by variations um, in the azimuthal uh, velocity. So this is often described as being in geostrophic balance, uh, which in this context really just means that the equation we wrote back at the start of the week for the balance between the centrifugal force, gravity, and the pressure gradient um, that this is satisfied accurately um, at each point uh, within, within the disk. So they describe these as zonal flows, and they're really quite similar to those sort of uh, zonal flows that are seen in planetary, uh, planetary atmospheres. Well, except in this case, they were seen in simulations, not in uh, the natural system. Okay. So there's been a fair amount of work subsequently on, uh, on zonal flows, and it's not entirely conclusive, for reasons uh, we'll say a little bit more about in a moment. Um, but it does seem that at least in magnetohydrodynamic simulations um, of disks, um, the appearance of zonal flows is a fairly generic property of disk MHD um, uh, turbulence. And in particular, you can find these zonal flows appearing not just in ideal MHD, which is what the original calculations uh, were, were, were done, but also in variations where, say, the ambipolar diffusion um, is the dominant non-ideal term, as would be appropriate for rather large radii um, within, uh, within the disk. So here's an example of that. So here we've got time in orbits. This is another one of these space-time diagrams. Um, and this is the radial coordinate here in units of the pressure scale height. And the colors here are reflecting fractional variations of the density away from the, uh, away from the mean density. And the bluest colors here are maybe 30 or 40 percent under dense. The reddest colors are maybe 30 or 40 percent um, over dense. 
And the two panels, this upper panel is an ideal MHD, and this lower panel is a disk model appropriate for 30 AU of a minimum mass uh, solar nebula uh, with amber polar diffusion and also with a net magnetic field um, threading the disk. And in both of these cases, you can see that starting from, if you like, uniform surface density across this simulation domain, uh, you get these stripes of uh, over-density and under-density um, appearing, which are rather persistent, right? They last for tens, perhaps in some cases approaching hundreds um, of orbital um, periods, okay? So the amplitudes here are in the tens of percents. You see the scale here, and the lifetimes are tens to hundreds of orbits. So these are not, uh, if you like, very transient structures. They're not just uh, the flickering or, or fluctuations in turbulence that you would ordinarily expect. Here you've really built up a large-scale structure that is in hydrostatic equilibrium uh, and basically just sits there until something happens in the turbulence uh, to subsequently um, destroy it. Okay. Now, what, what can we say about the caveats to this or the things we, uh, we don't know? Um, well, one thing is that if you look at these pictures, what you may notice is that the size of these structures appears to be rather comparable to the, uh, the size of the simulation box in which the calculation um, was done. So as you can see, there's, at early times here, there's maybe uh, you know, two overdensities in, uh, in the simulation box. At the end time here, there's only one of those uh, structures. So if you like, that is maybe consistent with the idea that these are an inverse cascade process in the turbulence. But it's also a little bit concerning because it says that if we did this calculation with an even larger box, then we'd get larger physical scales um, of these structures developing. And that says, of course, that we really are missing some physics because clearly the, the actual size of structures that should form in the disk shouldn't depend on just our size of uh, simulations. And this is probably a limitation of the fact that these calculations and many other calculations of this kind are done in local, in local volumes. Okay? So there's some other work which has been done in global disk ca calculations uh, that also supports the idea that you might find zonal flows, but those zonal flows are maybe not quite as easy to identify in those global calculations as in these uh, local ones. Okay, now, how could those zonal flows um, be important? Okay, well, we've already heard um, a little bit about this. Um, if they were strong enough to produce local pressure maximum, then as we discussed this morning, those local pressure maxima would act to trap particles and lead to overdensities of particles in those, um, in, those, um, in those locations. So here's calculations from Pinilla et al. from a couple of years ago. And what you can see here, uh, these are, are different uh, times here we're looking at from uh, 0.5 mega years down to, uh, down to 5 mega years. We're going out to about 100 um, AU here. And the colors here are representing uh, the distribution of particle sizes, which are forming in a, in a calculation where particles are being allowed to coagulate and fragment and have the full collisional evolution um, that they would, like to, uh, they would like to have. And what's been done here has been to not take uh, a completely smooth disk model, but instead to take a disk model that has many, many ripples uh, in it as you go, um, as you go outwards. Okay? So what you can see here is that that's then reflected in where the, uh, the particles are. They have these sort of fingers uh, pointing upwards here where the particles are being partially trapped. Uh, they're sitting there for longer than they would do otherwise. They have more opportunity um, to grow uh, collisionally. So if there are these zonal flows uh, throughout the disk, this could provide at least a partial alleviation of this radial drift problem that we've been, uh, we've been talking about all week. This would be a way to stop the radial drift, at least temporarily, um, allow the particles to collide more easily and grow to uh, larger sizes. Now, something that one might note about this um, is that for this to work, you need to actually create pressure maxima, or if, rather for this to be important for particle growth, you need to create pressure maxima. Okay? Now, in the sort of simple calculations uh, we're showing here, where you start with a uniform surface density, this is very easy, because any kind of peak you get in the surface density is automatically a pressure maximum. Okay? Now, it's a little bit more difficult in a real disk, because in a real disk, of course, the surface density is probably dropping off fairly steeply, particularly in the outer regions, once you get beyond that, uh, that exponential cutoff we've, uh, we've been hearing about. So then you actually need quite, you know, stronger ripples in order for the ripples to actually make a maximum in the pressure that would act to trap particles. And so Pinilla et al., as you can maybe see from these plots, considered quite small-scale zonal flows, because that way, if they're radially small, 
a relatively small amplitude will lead actually to a, to a pressure maximum. So there's a little bit of tension here between uh, the simulations, the direct simulations, and what's assumed in these collisional models. In the collisional models, people tend to assume rather narrow zonal flows, whereas the evidence from the simulations tends to, to support instead uh, rather broader uh, structures. Okay, now, of course, we, we, have, to, we have to show the HL, uh, the HL tower image at this point, um, because this is a way to produce axisymmetric features um, within, within disks. And so if we are interested or thinking about ways one might be able to, in principle, produce axisymmetric features in disks without having planets, zonal flows are basically the, uh, the only game we, ha we have in town. So zonal flows will lead to axisymmetric ring-like structures. And again, if they're strong enough to produce pressure maxima, then even if they're only you know, tens of percent uh, in amplitude in the gas, they can potentially produce a stronger response than that in the particles, depending, of course, on what the particle size is. If the particle size is close to tau of one, then particles will be very strongly clumped inside these rings. If instead we have much smaller particles, um, then they will not um, be clumped uh, very strongly in the rings. Now, of course, this is not really, a, uh, unfortunately, a unique prediction, because if we're looking in the dust, the dust is necessarily responding not just to whatever's going on in the disk, uh, whether it's planets or something else, but it also has some aerodynamic response. So it's actually a fairly generic prediction that you know, large particles uh, will have uh, you know, more pronounced peaks than small particles, whatever is causing the rings, whether it's zonal flows, whether it's planets, um, or something else. So, as I was mentioning, though, there are some uncertainties um, in, these, uh, in, in zonal flows, um, and the most important of which is what is really um, the characteristic um, radial scale. Okay? So in simulations, uh, in local simulations, the characteristic scales are typically quite a large number of scale heights, maybe five or ten um, scale heights. Um, we don't really know whether we're really getting a converged answer uh, in local calculations, um, or whether, in fact, effects that are really just pleasant in global disks um, would be necessary to really get a, a good estimate of that. So, yeah, so the question was whether it, those were local calculations with vertical stratification. Yes, th those did have vertical stratification in them, yeah. And then the second uncertainty uh, is that if we're interested in the outer part of the disk, we've already said that amber polar diffusion is the dominant effect um, in that region, and the structures you get there also depend on the strength and potentially on the evolution of net magnetic field um, threading, threading the disk. So some recent work by Juning Bai and, uh, and Jim Stone has emphasized that the magnetic flux you get within the disk uh, is not just completely uniform, uh, but tends to actually clump up as well in the regions of these, um, of these zonal flows. So there's some fairly complicated feedback there between what's happening with the gas, whether it's producing pressure maxima, how the magnetic fields, even the vertical magnetic fields that are threading the disk, are really responding um, to, that, uh, to that situation. Okay, so that's zonal flows, and I think even though it's maybe a little bit early, let's stop here for a five-minute uh, break, because then we'll switch to a different topic, which will be the vortices.
Okay, so that was, that was zonal flows. That was the easy one. Now let's, um, now let's discuss, uh, discuss vortices. Okay? And I think it's appropriate here to begin uh, with a quote by someone else that also uh, slightly uh, encapsulates my feeling about uh, vortices, at least un until recently. So this was the... Uh, this is an astronomy and astrophysics paper, you know, where they start with the, uh, the context, uh, e even in the abstract. And Lazira and Papaloizu, or now six years ago, uh, began the abstract context. The existence of large-scale and long-lived 2D vortices in accretion disks has been debated, and then it went on to say, for more than a decade. Okay? And indeed, vortices involve a whole bunch of interesting and complicated, complicated issues that are quite interlinked and, uh, and related, okay? And so the issues uh, that, uh, that crop up when you start thinking about vortices are, first of all, of course, how you can form vortices within a disk in the, uh, in the first place, okay? So how can you form them? And then if you've managed to form them, uh, what is their long-term stability properties, okay? And as we'll see, uh, this question of long-term stability has been one that uh, people have gone very much back and forth on at different times in the literature. Okay? So how long, if you, you know, if you form one vortex in the disk, how long will that vortex be able to survive in the disk? And then a more recent question people have worried about, which actually we won't get into very much today, is will the vortex migrate radially through the disk um, while it's present, before it, uh, before it ends up uh, being destroyed? Then there's another point, which is, are vortices going to be efficient at producing angular momentum transport. Okay, so you know, one picture might be that vortices are, if you like, the whole story of protoplanetary disks, and so they're important not just for concentrating particles and producing turbulence, but also for producing the angular momentum transport that leads to, uh, to accretion. And that turns out to be uh, an interesting question because a vortex, in principle, could be present in an incompressible disk, so with, uh, with uh, if you like, an infinite sound speed. Um, and in that limit, uh, vortices do not produce any angular momentum transport. Okay? So angular momentum transport associated with vortices is, if you like, a secondary feature of the vortices uh, associated with the fact that they tend to radiate waves. Okay? So how efficient vortices are at producing angular momentum transport turns out to be quite a subtle thing um, to look at. And then the purpose uh, that we're most interested in today um, is the role they might play in particle concentration. Okay? And this is, I think, uh, as we'll see, um, maybe the most important role that vortices could have um, if they're present um, within disks. Now, discussion about these questions has been going on for a long time, uh, and you know, as I say, it's very much gone, gone back and forth. And maybe if you'd asked me uh, you know, a few years ago, I would have sort of just sort of said, you know, put, put my hands up in despair and say, you know, don't tell me any more about vortices, please, I'm, I'm tired of it. Um, but then, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, there was the ALMA image of IRS uh, 48, which we've, we've seen a number of times um, this week. And I think, you know, just looking at that image, you know, without, without going any further, uh, just looking at the image, it's sort of immediately obvious that having a vortex in the disk is the most obvious interpretation, the naive interpretation of just what you see. Okay? And so that's uh, created a lot of new interest in vortices, where the focus has sort of shifted, perhaps, from thinking about vortices being present everywhere in disks to being interested in vortices on these large observable scales where they might produce observable particle concentration. So there's been a lot of new interest in vortices, and uh, my previous kind of despair about vortices has uh, slightly dissipated. Okay, so let's uh, first start with some, uh, some basics about vortices. So what are these uh, things? Well, they're, you know, as the name suggests, they're rotating structures which are superimposed on the background uh, Keplerian uh, shear. Okay? So the nice thing about vortices, compared perhaps to these MHD turbulent things we've, uh, we've talked about, is that you know, we all have an intuitive feel of what vortices are, right? You know, whirlpools in, uh, in rivers and the oceans um, and, things, uh, and things like that. And one of the nice things uh, about vortices is that there is a simple model, uh, the so-called KEDA solution, which dates back to 1981, um, which is an exact solution, uh, analytic solution, for a vortex within um, a protoplanetary disk. Okay? And so here's uh, just, this is basically just uh, really to illustrate how simple the solution is. Um, this is the velocity field for the vortex core in this uh, KEDA solution. For a vortex which has a particular vorticity, an aspect ratio, so that's the uh, ratio of the long dimension to the, uh, to the short dimension 
um, in the vortex, and uh, in a disk with a particular background vorticity um, s. In, this, uh, in these variables, uh, this, is, uh, this is as given in uh, Lisieux um, and Papaloisieux. So here, the x direction is now the uh, azimuthal direction in the disk. The y direction would be uh, the radial direction. Uh, this vortex is exactly aligned with the, uh, with the rotational uh, direction um, in the disk. Uh, and it has this x and this y um, velocity field. Okay? Now, this is just the velocity field in the, in the very core of the vortex. Uh, however, if you look in uh, Lejeune and Papaloisu, you'll see there's an analytic form, quite a bit more complicated, but an analytic form for the whole velocity field, not just in the core, but extending out all the way until it merges back into the, uh, into the, uh, into the background disk. And so the vortices that would be present in disks generally uh, look like this one shown here. They tend to be elongated in the, uh, in the azimuthal direction. Uh, they might have aspect ratios of two or greater. So two, three, four, five, um, and, and so on. Okay? So that's what, they, uh, that's what it looks like. OK, now, what kind of vortices can you have? Uh, well, the type that are stable in disks are anticyclonic um, vortices. So those would be high pressure systems, if you like, um, in weather systems um, on Earth. And the interest in vortices from a planet formation perspective, to say, was speculated about uh, in the 40s uh, in models of planet formation that are basically now, now long, long forgotten or discredited, um, but was reinvigorated in the 90s uh, by this paper by Barge and Samaria, um, who showed that if you take one of these vortices and then consider how particles would behave if they uh, interact with the vortex, then they have this tendency to come in and spiral in uh, towards, um, towards the core. Okay? So here, this would be the, uh, the radial direction here. This is, again, the, the azimuthal direction. And here, this uh, solid line uh, is showing yeah trajectory of a particle that's captured in a gaseous vortex, penetrates into the vortex, spirals in uh, towards, um, towards the center. Okay? So if you have one of these vortices, you know, described perhaps by this simple analytic solution, you then just trace the aerodynamic motion of particles given that, uh, given that velocity field. Uh, what you find is that the vortices will act as concentration sites of the particles um, in the disk. Okay? So in that sense, they're, you know, they work in the same way as zonal flows or other kinds of pressure maxima, except here, of course, they have the interesting property that they're not uh, axisymmetric structures. They're really uh, point-like structures, but generally rather extended point-like structures um, within, within disks. OK, so that's why we should be interested in vortices. If we did have vortices, they definitely would be good at concentrating, uh, concentrating particles. Okay? And once the particles, of course, are concentrated in the vortex, then relative to the vortex, they don't really want to move. Okay? So in that sense, they also uh, you know, work against radial drift. Right? They would be drifting in radially. Now they've been captured by the vortex. Now, of course, the vortex itself might migrate radially through the disk as well, carrying its particles with it. So it's not completely the case that everything is going to be stationary uh, in, in, uh, in orbital distance. But at least the, the main part of the radial drift will be stopped. So how could we form them? Well, we've already discussed one way uh, to form them. Uh, which was at the end of this morning, this was this Rossby wave um, instability. Okay? And we mentioned that the Rossby wave instability occurs when you have a maximum in the pressure and density in the disk, and that maximum is sufficiently compact in terms of its radial extent and strong in terms of its, um, of its amplitude. And as I said, the sort of hand-waving condition is that we're talking about tens of percent in amplitude of the surface density on scale heights, on distances of about um, a scale height. Now, this can be formed, uh, this can be triggered uh, by having a massive planet that grows within a sufficiently low viscosity disk. And here's the argument. Let's imagine we start with a smooth surface density profile. So this would be log sigma um, and log r. And we put a planet in the disk uh, at some particular radius. OK, so you've seen some, some real calculations of planets uh, forming within disks and what it does to the, to the surface density profile in, in, in Willie's lectures. Here's just a, a cartoon of it. Um, the point to notice, which was emphasized before, is that when the planet forms in the disk, it creates a gap. And that gap is not formed primarily by material accreting onto the planet, but rather by the gravitational uh, interaction of the planet with the gas, which tends to push the gas away from the orbit um, of the planet. 
So you have a gap formed, and then on the edges of the gap, you have initially a surface density bump, okay, where actually the density is higher than it would have been if the planet um, hadn't, ha hadn't been there. Now, if the disk is too viscous, then the viscosity will very rapidly act to smooth out um, this, this bump at the edges of the disk. And if, you, if the gas can actually flow across the gap, as we heard, that does tend to happen in numerical simulations, then actually there won't be you know, a bump on the edges of the gap for very long. However, if the viscosity is low, that material that's just piled up there won't tend to go away for some period um, of time. And during that time, this uh, bump in the, uh, in the surface density could be unstable to the Rossby wave instability, and then it could spawn vortices potentially at both sides um, of, the, uh, of the gap edges there. Okay, so that's how a planet could do it. Uh, let's emphasize uh, that any other process that led to an unstable surface density profile um, could work to spawn vortices in exactly the same way. So there's nothing really special about the, uh, the planet situation. Uh, it's just that forming a planet is actually a rather good way of producing this unstable situation um, at different locations um, in the disk. Now, something else you might note is that, you know, how this would work does depend somewhat on how the planet is formed, okay? Now, the simplest situation and the one that's often done in simulations is to take a smooth disk and put the planet in there, uh, you know, either with its uh, final mass or grow it to its final mass on rather a short time scale. Now, that's a very conducive way to producing these bumps that then spawn vortices. If instead you imagine the planet forms very, very slowly, uh, then actually you might not get such a strong bump at the edges of the gap. That's not quite such a good situation for forming the vortices. So exactly how the planet forms and how quickly it forms compared to the orbital time scale at the radius you're considering uh, is sort of an important parameter uh, in this kind of a story. Okay, so that's, that's one way to form vortices. Obviously, if that's the, way, the only way we can form vortices, then they can't play a central role in planet formation. Because if the only way to form a, uh, a vortex is to have a massive planet in the disk, then you know, how did we form that massive planet that formed the vortex? Right? We, have a, we have an obvious chicken and egg uh, problem there. So if we want to form vortices somewhere else, we need a, a more general mechanism for forming vortices that doesn't depend on having uh, planets. And the main possibility here is something that in the astrophysical community uh, goes by this name of the baroclinic um, instability. Now, this is a really bad name um, for, this, uh, for this instability because in the atmospheric physics community, uh, people have an instability that they call the baroclinic instability, and they thought of it before we did. Uh, and the, their baroclinic instability is not the same as our baroclinic instability. Okay? So it causes endless confusion if people from these two communities ever have the misfortune to meet. Okay? So, in this context, in the disk context, as I say, not in the context of atmospheres, what this refers to is a nonlinear instability that is driven by a particular radial entropy profile um, in the disk. And in the astrophysical context, it's a two-dimensional instability. So it would be present even in a disk model as a thin, uh, a thin sheet in the radial and azimuthal directions with no significant structure um, in height. Okay? And what this instability does is it drives the production of vortices in disks that have an appropriate radial entropy profile. Okay? Now, let me try to explain a little bit how this would uh, work. And the way to think about this, perhaps, is that this is in some sense uh, a little bit related to the idea of radial convection in disks. Okay? Now, when you first think about convection, you probably hear about it in the context of stars, and you don't initially worry about rotation or you just consider perhaps non-rotating uh, stars. Okay? So when you sort of hear about that, what you think about is taking a parcel of gas at some uh, temperature and pressure conditions that are appropriate for some location, and moving that parcel uh, radially in the star, or in, in this case, um, in the disk. Now, the gas, let's assume the gas within that parcel behaves adiabatically. So as it moves outwards into a lower pressure region, it expands and it cools. Okay? Now, when it cools, it can either, when it moves to the new location, be hotter or cooler than the background gas at that uh, location. Okay? And the way it works is that you know, if when it gets to this higher location, so imagine now this is a star for the moment, we'll, we'll come back to a disk in a minute, if when it gets to this higher location, its density is lower than the background, it's buoyant, 
and it will tend to accelerate further in that, uh, in that direction. Okay? So that's just ordinary um, convection. So a convective, uh, an entropy profile that is convective by that condition is said to be Schwarzschild unstable. Now in a disk, there's a complexity, which is obviously that the rotation is very strong. And the rotation stabilizes the fluid against convection. Okay? So almost all, or effectively all entropy profiles that we might have present in protoplanetary disks would be stable to ordinary convection because of the stabilizing effect of the rotation. Okay? But they could still be Schwarzschild unstable, um, which would mean they would be unstable to convection if we suddenly if you like, turned off the disk rotation. Now, the fact that they're Schwarzschild unstable doesn't normally sort of matter, really, because obviously the disk really is rotating, and so we have to include rotation uh, in the stability condition. But it turns out that a disk that is between the Schwarzschild unstable convection regime and then the regime where it would really be unstable, including the rotation, is unstable to a nonlinear instability that works to reinforce vortices. So this is how this works. We take a parcel of gas, and imagine, let's imagine we already have um, a vortex in the disk. Then as that parcel of gas moves out, it becomes buoyant and accelerates. It then thermalizes uh, to the temperature at the, uh, the new radial direction, and then it sinks back uh, uh, roughly in adiabatic conditions, and then thermalizes again as it comes around this bottom part of the vortex. Now, if you look here, you see that what this means is that basically along a particular radius, uh, there is a temperature perturbation which has a phi dependence because this is cold gas sinking and then it warms up as it comes into thermal equilibrium with the background. So within this vortex, there's this temperature perturbation which if you then work through the, uh, work through the physics of this instability, acts to reinforce this rotating vortical flow. So if you have this vortex, uh, this, this temperature perturbation, which amounts to a, um, a baroclinic term in the equation, which is where the name comes from, acts to self-sustain the production um, of this vortex. Okay? So this instability uh, was first discussed by Clara and Bodenheimer in global simulations of protoplanetary disks. Um, this kind of interpretation of exactly how it works um, was developed a little bit later um, and is particularly clear in uh, Lisieux and Papaloisu uh, 2010. So here's, uh, here's just some simulations of that. So this is uh, this uh, Lesieux and Papaloisu paper. Uh, here is the, uh, the azimuthal direction, the radial direction. These are three-dimensional uh, calculations. And here they've set up uh, an unstable entropy profile according to this condition. And indeed, uh, it works to produce um, these vortices um, within, within the flow. And the general property of the vortices, not just from this mechanism, but also from other mechanisms that might produce vortices, is that even if they start off on small scales, the vortices have a tendency to merge. And so if you wait long enough, uh, at each radius, or you know, across a range of radii, there'll just be one giant vortex uh, sitting there, which will have been the, the merged product um, of all the small vortices that were initially uh, created. OK, so that's how you might uh, form these vortices. There's another possibility, which I'll just briefly mention. Of course, there might be pre-existing vortices um, in the disk. Uh, if the disk formed, for example, from clumpy accretion um, or from accretion that has a very well-specified amount of specific angular momentum, then the conditions when the disk forms might have uh, vortices already present in the disk or be very conducive to forming them um, immediately. So early times when the disk hasn't, if you like, forgotten how it formed from star formation might be another good time um, for having vortices uh, within disks. Okay, so that's how we might form vortices. So there seems to be quite an, a menu of possibilities for forming vortices. Um, how stable are they? Well, if the disk was two-dimensional and had no viscosity, then vortices you place in there have this inverse cascade property of growing into one large vortex, but then that vortex can basically survive for a very, very long time um, within the disk. So that would be really the analog of something like uh, Jupiter's great, uh, great Red Spot. Now, in three-dimensional disks, however, there is a reasonably well-known instability of vortices which acts to destroy them. Okay? And that's described as the elliptical instability. And roughly speaking, what happens here is that when you have a vortex, um, the rate of turnover of the vortex um, is, can be resonant with the orbital period of the, uh, of the gas um, around the star. Okay? And this resonance works to create a secondary turbulence in the vortex, which eventually shreds it and destroys it 
and returns you to the background um, disk solution. Okay? So here's uh, some simulations by Lazier and Papaloizu. Here you start with a nice, uh, nice well-defined vortex. As time goes on, these three-dimensional perturbations to the vortex start growing, and then by some late time, as you can see, the nice vortex you started with has been completely, uh, has been completely destroyed um, and shredded. So this elliptical instability has been quite well studied. Um, it definitely leads to destruction of vortices um, in three dimensions. How fast it grows depends quite sensitively on the aspect ratio um, of the vortex. So compact vortices that are sort of not quite circular but relatively circular have a very different growth rate of this instability than ones that are very long um, and skinny. Now, another possibility is vertical shear in the disk. We've already mentioned there should be some vertical shear in the background velocity field of the disk, um, and this may also affect uh, the stability of vortices um, that, are, that are present. Okay, so these instabilities are present. However, something to bear in mind is that the growth rate of these instabilities tends to be rather slow. So the sort of timescales you need for these secondary instabilities to grow can be hundreds, or in some cases, even thousands of orbits. Okay? Now, if you're thinking about vortices at one AU, that doesn't necessarily matter because uh, the, you know, the disk lives for millions of orbits at one AU. However, if instead we're thinking about a large vortex that we might be observing in an ALMA image, then a thousand orbits might be the whole lifetime of the disk out at 50 or 100 um, AU. Okay? So in that case, whether there are for those, those vortices are formally unstable or not, doesn't really matter so much, right? These perturbations might be growing out there, but just simply haven't yet reached an amplitude where they could destroy the observed um, vortical structure. Okay, now what about trapping um, of particles? Okay, well here, uh, you know, the, the more recent work uh, basically supports the, the older analytic work um, that was done on, on particle trapping. So here's an example from a work by Zhao Anzhu uh, from last year. Uh, so here's a, a gas disk with a, with a planet embedded in it, uh, which has formed um, a large vortex uh, by this sort of process I was, uh, I was describing earlier. In fact, here you've got a vortex both on the outside and you've got a vortex um, on the inside of where the planet uh, gap is. And here what they've considered is a number of different particle sizes, which correspond as usual to different uh, stopping times, 0.02, 0.2, 0.2, and then these are even larger particles that we don't, uh, we're not considering here. And what you can see is that as you go from rather small particles to much larger ones, uh, then the larger particles become really very strongly trapped um, in the vortex. So if you look at this 0.2 stopping time here, you can see the vortex is very clearly delineated by a concentration of particles here, and then the vortex on the inside is also very clearly delineated. Uh, there's also particles being trapped in the horseshoe region um, of, this, uh, of this simulation, which may be reflecting the fact that the planet has grown relatively quickly, um, and so there's still quite a bit of gas surviving in the horseshoe region um, of, this, uh, of this system. Okay, so this can be a, a rather strong effect. So here's some different simulations, but uh, sort of in principle rather similar ones. Uh, so here we're looking at the concentration of particles, dust particles, um, in a vortex. So no the thing to note here is that this scale here uh, well, from top to bottom is three orders of magnitude um, in concentration. Uh, this is in terms of time. And here again, we have particles of different stopping time. And for particles of the right stopping time, you're here picking up maybe two orders of magnitude concentration of dust within the core of the vortex compared to what it would have had in the disk um, without, uh, without the vortex. So this concentration of solids within vortex cores uh, can, be rather, can be rather strong here. Now, a problem, however, is that if you get too many solids accumulating in the vortex, then for the same sorts of reasons we were talking about yesterday, the effect of the solids feeding back on the gas dynamics can't be, can't be ignored anymore. Okay? And it turns out that that feedback tends to destroy the vortex as well. So even if we have a circumstance, you know, a purely two-dimensional circumstance, where the vortex is indefinitely stable, just in the gas sense, if we load it up with too many particles, the feedback of those particles, the aerodynamic feedback of those particles on the gas, will work to, uh, to destroy the vortex. And that's what's shown, uh, shown here. Uh, this is work by Fu et al. from last year. Uh, here's the gas vortex lifetime. 
Uh, and here, they're loading the vortex with particles of different sizes. So this would be millimeter-sized particles uh, here, centimeter-sized particles here. So these different sizes have different stopping times. So, as you can see from this plot on the left, the particles with large stopping times are the ones that get very strongly concentrated uh, in the vortex, and they're also the most efficient um, at destroying the vortex. So here you get an order of magnitude uh, change in the vortex lifetime if you load it up with particles of a few millimeters in size that have stopping times uh, that are maybe 0.2 um, or 0.3. Okay? So here we have a sort of you know, a complicated story. Okay? The vortex could be important at concentrating particles, but if we concentrate too many particles, actually it will break up the vortex um, entirely. Okay. So what does that suggest then? Well, that suggests that if vortices are important for you know, some early stage of, uh, of planet formation, perhaps for planetesimal formation, the sort of overall scenario uh, is sort of involves several different, uh, different steps. Okay? So first of all, it involves having conditions that would be conducive to forming vortices in the first place. So if we don't have any planets there initially, that would say mean that this baroclinic instability is operating to produce vortices from the, the background entropy structure um, in the disk. And then within those vortices, particles of the right stopping time, maybe, maybe stopping time of 1 or 0.1, or in that, roughly speaking in that range, will start to concentrate strongly um, in the core. Now, if nothing else happens, eventually perhaps enough particles would concentrate there to actually just wipe out the vortex and release the particles back into the disk. But potentially you could have something else happening. You could get to conditions, for example, where the streaming instability or direct gravitational instability, the kind of processes we were talking about yesterday, those could be triggered by having the vortex present um, within the disk. And in that case, the vortex would sort of work to, to create planetesimals which would then orbit freely of the vortex and spread back um, into, uh, into the disk. So what you would need then is for these instabilities or collapse to be triggered before the feedback of the solids on the gas became strong enough to actually uh, destroy the vortex. So this is the kind of scenario that's proposed in this paper by Rittiger now from, uh, from this year. I think this is still just um, on Astro PH. Uh, here again, uh, we have a, a gas uh, phase um, uh, picture. Here we have some particles within, uh, within the vortex. Uh, you can see here uh, the, you know, the vortex is not quite as, uh, as nice. It doesn't look quite like the analytic solution anymore. Um, but it has still managed to concentrate particles quite strongly uh, in, the central, in the central regions. And they've argued here that this then can trigger um, these additional instabilities that would lead to, uh, to planetesimal formation. Okay. okay, so by this stage, uh, perhaps you're just getting a bit frustrated here and just want the answer, right? Are vortices important or not? Okay? And of course, I can't tell you the answer, right? But let me give you my opinion with, uh, in a couple of slides um, at, the, uh, at the end here, okay? So, you know, how we think about this um, depends substantially on what application we're, we're interested in. And as I was mentioning, the sort of the new application or the newer application that we're interested in is, you know, are vortices responsible for producing some of these very asymmetric transition disks, which are being observed particularly with, um, with, uh, with ALMA. Okay? So my opinion of this is that the interpretation of these asymmetries um, as being due to vortices, which are present in the disk on the, these large scales and are trapping particles, is indeed a plausible explanation for what is seen. Indeed, you know, if you just look at the data, it's perhaps the obvious explanation that, that occurs to you uh, when you see it. And the reason that this is plausible is that basically it does uh, reflect the sort of basic physical understanding we've had of vortices for a long time, predating um, these observations. In particular, if we have vortices in disks produced by whatever mechanism, their natural tendency is to merge into a single large vortex. So the fact that what is seen is you know, basically a, a left-right or up-down asymmetry in the disk, all the particles on one side and none on the other, is really quite consistent with having this very large-scale um, vortical uh, asymmetry. Moreover, if the vortex is in the outer disk, then the uh, stopping time that corresponds to tau of 1 is, roughly speaking, in the millimeter to centimeter range for fairly reasonable assumptions about what the gas density in the disk is. So particles that would be directly observed in the submillimeter are the right-size particles for being concentrated in vortices that are present at that point um, within, uh, within the disk.
Moreover, smaller dust particles, of course, would not be trapped, and that is also consistent generally with what is seen. Okay, when people look at different shorter wavelengths, uh, the dust of those shorter wavelengths, smaller dust particles, is much more uh, axisymmetrically distributed um, in those uh, systems. And then, most importantly of all, the big uncertainty with vortices has always been um, if we can create them, how long will they actually survive before these various processes act to destroy them again? Okay? And that's still a problem, right? Because there are these instabilities that definitely destroy vortices. And if, say, you form a planet, it's really a, you, a, you have one shot at producing vortices. The planet creates the vortices because it creates this gap, and the gap creates the bumps that then create the vortices. If those vortices eventually dissipate, the planet doesn't recreate new vortices. Okay? then we're back to a situation that has no vortices um, within the disk. However, that's not a problem uh, for these uh, systems because these long timescales, the long orbital timescales out here, mean that even if the, the vortices are in principle unstable to being destroyed, there may simply not be enough time for the, for the processes to actually uh, destroy them. Okay? So all of these things suggest that this is quite a, quite a, a feasible uh, interpretation of what is being seen. Now, what it does require, however, is low viscosity. Okay? If the viscosity was an alpha of 10 to the minus 2, then generally it would probably be very difficult to form vortices um, that would then trap the particles. So a, a, a viscosity, an alpha of 10 to the minus 3 or even 10 to the minus 4, um, is a much more favorable circumstance uh, for producing vortices um, from this kind of planet uh, mechanism. Now that's in fact uh, potentially fine, because as we, uh, we saw earlier in the week, if we're in the region where ambipolar uh, diffusion is damping the MRI, those low alphas may actually be the natural outcome of MHD processes in that part um, of the disk. So in principle, that's fine. The one thing I would perhaps mention is that if we had that very low alpha in that part of the disk, the disk at those scales is not really operating like an accretion disk anymore, because actually the viscous time scale then from 100 AU might well be longer than 10 million years. So the gas then really is not really accreting from those scales towards the star. It would basically be just sitting there. And that would be rather a change to how we, uh, we envisage protoplanetary disks if really on the large scale the turbulence is so weak that it doesn't actually lead to a significant accretion from the outer reservoir um, of gas. And then just to note, of course, a, you know, a planet would work to spawn this vortex. Of course, it's not strictly necessary. If the vortex could form by another process, that would also work. So then let me just finish then by commenting what about um, a more general role in planet formation. Um, here the situation I think is, is not quite so uh, clear because what you would need is vortices to be present and to survive in the disk on all scales, including on the much smaller scales where potentially these uh, instabilities that would destroy vortices would have time um, to operate. So you would require this ongoing source of vorticity and probably this baroclinic instability um, is the leading candidate um, for producing vortices um, on those scales. Okay, we'll stop there. I should be able to explain, but I'm not going to be able to reconstruct the argument uh, well enough to give it correctly. So I will promise that it, it will be present in the written version of the lectures, um, which you may consult then. But yeah, so it, you know, it's, it's, it's a well understood property of, of, of turbulence, um, but it's, it's just not one I'm, I'm able to give a, an immediate explanation of here. Yeah, so, um, so yes, actually the, the places we were sort of talking about this morning where there was sort of like a persistent, persistent structure in the disk, you know, those can also be, be good places for vortices, right? So indeed, the inner edge of a dead zone um, is, such a, is such a location, right? Uh, you know, the simplest thing that could happen there is, is an axisymmetric structure would form, 
but you know, just as with a planet, really, that could be a, a place where vortices also, also form. And you know, there, it would be different from the planet case in that you know, the, the reason the vortices were forming would really be a, a, a constant thing. So that, uh, the inner edge of a dead zone, if it's unstable to producing vortices, could keep, keep producing vortices, um, even if they're subsequently destroyed if, as they migrate um, through the disk. So I think that's quite a, quite a plausible um, uh, scenario for, for something happening at that location, yes. Oh, the, the, the vortices, yes. Um, well, I think, you know, on, on general grounds, you would say, uh, you know, the best places to form vortices are, are away from the midplane, right? And that's indeed what's seen in simulations. Um, it's also true that, you know, if you form a vortex, then actually it does develop a three-dimensional velocity field as well as its two-dimensional velocity field. And, for example, some of those papers uh, discussing how particles behave in vortices um, emphasize that actually that can give you some extra vertical stirring, if you like, within the core of the vortex. So, you know, that would suggest that, you know, there's some difference in the, in the thickness of the particle layer that, 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 would be, that would be seen there, okay? So there certainly is some, uh, some, some vertical component there. Uh, clearly, from the point of view of observations, it's the, you know, it's the two-dimensional velocity field that would be the, the thing you would hope to be able to see, but uh, 